Lecture six: Two mathematics cultures and a few mathematical lives. So we will first talk about two mathematics civilizations, which include the Greek mathematics as well as the Chinese mathematics, and then we will talk about a few mathematical lives, including Archimedes, Hippasus, Gauss, and Galois. So we will start with some characteristics of ancient mathematics. Let's take a look at this problem of ancient Babylonian mathematics. So the problem said that sixty is the circumference, two is the perpendicular. Find the chord, and then it provides a solution: double two and get four. Take four from twenty and get sixteen. Square twenty to get four hundred, square sixteen and get two fifty six. Take two fifty six from four hundred to get one forty four. Find the square root of one forty four. Twelve. The square root is the chord. This is the procedure. Then you may question if the procedure makes sense. So let's take a look here. So it said double two and get four. It means that here you have a two. So by symmetry, here imagine that you also get another two. So there is another chord here. So two two is four, and take four from twenty and get sixteen. Then where did we get twenty? There is no twenty in the question. So basically, the Babylonian implicitly assumed that pi is three. So when the circumference is sixty, then they have the diameter. To be twenty, so the diameter here is twenty, and then we move four. Then here is sixteen. Then what they're going to do is they're going to move this sixteen here because the length is the same. And remember that here the diameter is twenty. So twenty squared minus sixteen squared, and then they find the chords square, which is one hundred forty-four, and then they take the square root. So they know that the chord is twelve, and this is the answer. So we know that for more than forty six hundred years ago, Babylonian knew about the relationship of diameter and the circumference. They also knew about Pythagoras theorem, as well as how to take square roots. So most ancient mathematics treatises in almost all civilizations are in the problem solution format. They used particular numerical values for typical problems. And outline the procedure of obtaining the solution. We studied the Ryan Papias in the first tutorial, so this is problem fourteen of the Ryan Papias. Dividing a hundred loaves among five men in such a way that the share received should be an arithmetic progression, and that one third of the sum of the largest three shares shall be equal to the sum of the smallest two. How many loaves does each of them get? The Egyptian mathematics is similar to the Babylonian one, in the sense that their mathematics was in the problem, procedures, answered format. As ancient civilizations developed, the need for practical mathematics increased. They required numeration systems and arithmetic techniques for trade, measure strategies for construction, and astronomical calculations to track the seasons and cosmic cycles. That is why ancient classics focused on the practical side of mathematics. We will briefly take a look at the timeline of different civilizations. So the earliest would be Egyptians and Babylonian, and then we have Chinese. The Greek mathematics start roughly at six hundred BCE. Then we have Hindu, and then the Dark Ages last pretty long. Then we have Arabian, the period of transmission. In the first half and the second half of modern civilizations, Euclid's elements of geometry were translated into different languages: to Greek, eight hundred; to Arabic, twelve fifty; to Latin, eleven twenty; to French, fifteen sixty four; to English, fifteen seventy; to Chinese, sixteen seven. The figures shows the translation. Of proposition forty-seven in book one of elements, it talks about Pythagoras' theorem.
Euclid's Elements was a Greek classic on mathematics. There are thirteen books in Elements written by the Greek mathematician Euclid in Alexandria, roughly at three hundred BCE. This is one of the most read book in the history, second to the Bible. It adopted an axiomatic approach of mathematics. So when we say the Babylonian mathematics and the Egyptian mathematics, most of them are practical based. But in the Greek mathematics, it adopts a axiomatic approach. So what does it mean by axiomatic approach? It starts with some undefined terms. That means it accepted there are terms which could hardly be defined, and then it starts with definitions, axioms, theorems. And proofs. So it is built on something what we call the axioms. Axioms are called self-evident truth or fundamental rules. There are undefined terms as well as definitions. And then with all these, it uses logical deduction to deduce theorems. The practice that we do nowadays in all mathematics textbooks or mathematics research actually follow this practice. So right now, I would like you to pause the video and spend some time to watch the fundamentals of Euclid's elements. So we will start with the definitions, postulates, and axioms, and then please also spend time to read Proposition One and Two of Book One of the Elements. Did you find that the content of the videos sound like the contents of your mathematics textbooks? Jeech Hardy once said. The Greeks were the first mathematicians who are still real to us today. The Greeks first spoke a language which modern mathematicians can understand. As Leatherwood, his colleague, said to me once, "They are not clever schoolboys or scholarship candidates, but they are fellows of another college." And now we will move our discussion on Chinese mathematics. First dynasty in China is called Xia. It is roughly at two thousand BCE, and then we have Shang, Zhou, Han, Shi, Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, and the Qing Dynasty. So, in the Zhou Dynasty, the Third Dynasty, around one thousand to two hundred BCE, there was a mathematical or scientific test called Zhou Bi Shan Jing. It was found in the Western Han Dynasty. But claimed as authored during the Zhou Dynasty, so the English translation of the title is the arithmetical classic of the Normand and the circular paths of heaven. With the figure, I guess you can imagine that it's about astronomy as well as mathematics. It also contains the first description of the Pythagoras theorem. So it talks about that when you have a right angle triangle, then when you have Size three and four, then you will have to hypotenuse five. So it gives a specific cases of the Pythagoras theorem, and then in the Eastern Chow Dynasty, it contains two period. The first one is called Spring and Autumn period, and then the second one is called Warring States period. In the Spring and Autumn period, there's a man called Confucius. So he served the ruler of Lu, so one of the state. Confucius founded the first school, and he was considered as the greatest educator. He taught the six classical arts: writes, music, archery, writing, writing, and arithmetic. He emphasized stability and unity. Mao Zedong founded the school of Maoism. He argued strongly against Confucianism and Taoism. He had considerable influence during his period. He developed primitive version of logic and geometry. Here is an example. So he suggested that a circle is having the same name from one same center. Did you remember that you have also read the same thing in Euclid's Elements? After the Warring States period, then we have the Qin Dynasty, which only lasts for fifteen years. So he established the first United Emperor, but he burnt books and buried scholars. So many classics before his times were burnt. And then we have the Han Dynasty, which honored only Confucianism. 
So scholars transcribed from memory literacy and scientific texts and sought out manuscripts that had escaped destruction. And at that period, it was the combination of the nine chapters on the mathematical arts, which I have mentioned in the previous lecture. Book on Numbers and Computations was excavated in 1983 to 1984 in the term of the early West Han Dynasty. There were roughly 1,200 bamboo strips written in ink. It contains 69 mathematical problems which involved fractions, inverse proportions, factorization of numbers, geometric progression, volume of three-dimensional figures, and other plane geometry problems. After that, the full text of nine chapters on mathematical art can be dated back to 179 AD, but the contents were believed to have altered by many scholars for 800 years. It contains nine chapters on different mathematical topics and became the classical text that was studied in China for the next many centuries. And later on, many mathematicians also wrote notes on it. That is why sometimes we record the commentary on the nine chapters on the mathematical art. So in the previous chapter, I have already talked about the contents of the nine chapters, so I will skip it here. If you are interested to work on one of them in your group project, you are very welcome to do so. So once again, I want to mention the approach of the nine chapters. It is also similar to mathematics in Egypt as well as Babylon. It is in a problem-solution format. Most are of practical problems, and solutions emphasize on the procedural steps, and we cannot find proofs inside, so the contents are on a demonstration nature. This also summarizes the characteristics of the Chinese, Babylonian, and Egyptian mathematics, and it is very, very different from the Greek mathematics. Now we will move on to discuss some Chinese mathematicians. Liu Hui, roughly in 260 AD, made much contributions by commenting on the night chapters. He also wrote the Sea Island Mathematical Manual and other independent work. He applied the circle cutting method to compute pi within this range. Zhu Chongzi and his son were mathematicians during the dynasty of the North and the South. They compute pi to 3.1415265. This was remarkable at roughly five centuries. They also made another achievement, which is called the Zhu Gang Principle. Let's consider these two solids. If the corresponding areas at various levels are the same, and the heights are also the same, then the volumes of these solids cannot be different. Liu Hui also used the same principle earlier while trying to find the volume of the sphere. This principle is known as the Cavalieri Principle, which was 1,000 years later than Zhu Gang. Both these two mathematicians did not prove the principle. And we will have Shei Dynasty. It was a really short dynasty, but it has constructions of large-scale waterworks. And Tang Dynasty lasts for roughly 300 years. It was considered as a period of most productive in Chinese history. It opened to foreign influence. It was a period of literacy and artistic renaissance. It also has some remarkable technological advancements like gunpowder and printing. Yet there was not much important mathematical discovery during this period of time. In Tang Dynasty, mathematician Li also worked on the nine chapters, and here is his work on equations. So basically, this is exactly the Gaussian elimination method, but earlier than Gauss. But we must note that Gauss did far more in the area of solving systems of equations than the ancient Chinese. And then we have the Song Dynasty, which was also last for more than 300 years. It had considerable advancements in the areas of science and technology. There were quite a number of good mathematicians whose contributions mainly on computational algebra. Some new mathematics discoveries include matrix method of solving systems of linear equations, as well as Yuan Hui triangles, which was equivalent to Pascal's triangle. So this figure is about the coefficients when expanding a plus b to the power of n, where n ranges from 1 to 3 and so on. 
This was discovered by Young Hoyt at around 1503, which was much earlier than the time of Pascal. So we see here that one 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 two one one three three one one four six four one and so on. So basically, these are the coefficients when we expand、um, a plus b to the power of n. So after Song Dynasty, there was stagnation of development in science and mathematics. It seems that in the previous dynasty, there are some achievements made by the ancient Chinese mathematicians. It was caught up and surpassed by the West in the area of mathematics. In late Ming Dynasty, Western science and mathematics were introduced to China. There were some other achievements like magic squared, cometorics. Chinese remainder theorem in the Chinese history.